okay. Um, what tools do you use for debugging code? And are you already using Jupyter for some projects? And the usual questions down below. And today team, today's team is uh, notebooks and documentation. And really, the big picture theme is documentation. I would also consider notebooks mm. as as a, as a form of documenting what we do. And yeah. for every day, we something we started last week, which I think was fun and people liked it, is that we start the day with a little interview where we interview an expert uh, on on the topics of the day. And today's expert is Richard. So that I'm here so because Richard should not interview himself, <laughs> already managing so many things in parallel. And yeah. uh, so we can start today. Uh, Richard, when, if you're ready, I can yeah. ask you a few questions about uh, documentation notebooks. And then later, uh, we will introduce the speakers of today. And uh, then after the, so once the hour starts, we, we then start with the lessons. Yeah, I'm good. So if you're ready, um, maybe you can say just one or two sentences about what you work on and how you got there mm. before we go into the topics. So I work at a team at Alta University called Science IT, which is sort of a misnomer because it's not only the School of Science and it's not traditional IT work. So we basically support all other researchers with scientific computing types of work. Um, where how I got here. So I began studying uh, chemical engineering and then halfway through my bachelor's, I switched to chemistry. Or my PhD was in chemical physics. By the end of that, I was doing community detection in graphs and networks. I continued that with postdoctoral work and Finland at my current place. Uh, but by the end of that, I was doing data science and kind of stuff. But what unified all of these is they used computing. Mm -hmm. So basically, I was always a bit more interested in doing the work well than making the papers out of the work. Mm -hmm. So did you start programming? So it was during PhD that you really like started coding so, or earlier? So I'd say I dabbled a little bit when I was in high school or something, but mm -hmm. didn't really like, you know, I did stuff, but I didn't really, how do you say, get the true spirit of how it was useful or what it would become or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, do something and now forget it all. But it was yeah. once I started doing work um, in my, uh, as a research assistant when I was an undergraduate, then I started really learning things. So mm -hmm. I think my first project was in C, but then I started learning Python. And that's what I've mm -hmm. been doing a lot with. And so were you, when you started programming then in C and later Python, were you immediately excited about documentation or did it come later? <laughs> hmm. I'd probably say later. I have this mm -hmm. one repository, which I started during my PhD and continued with postdoc. And it has no readme file in there. Uh -huh. So I guess that sort of shows the extent of how late it was they started using really good practices. And what would you say do you know today about documentation that you wish you knew then, or maybe asking differently, what how do you approach documentation today versus how did you approach documentation earlier? Hmm actually try doing it? Is that too simple of an answer? <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, I'd say maybe the biggest thing is realizing that what I do, I want other people to use. Like, the things I make, no, okay, yeah, it's for me, and I'll take some notes now about how to use it in a readme file. But more often what I do, I have this expectation that other people will actually be using it. And, you know, like, mm -hmm. instead of expecting that papers and articles and so on are the output that I'm remembered by. Now it's the code and the software and things like that. And that mm -hmm. means instead of spending like weeks trying to 
write some paper, I'll spend a few minutes and then a few minutes every day improving documentation and it's much better overall anyway. Like I feel like that has a bigger impact and is more enjoyable. Mm. So writing uh, documentation can certainly also take weeks. <laughs> yeah. D so. Depending on, on what parts uh, one is doing. And, and we will touch upon that uh, later today when we when we discuss, I mean, what are diff the different kinds of documentation that, that one can work with? Yeah. Because it's not just one fit for all purposes, but, but a few different. Yeah. And I really emphasize this pyramid. I don't know if it should be a pyramid, but I mean, many projects don't need much. So start simple and that's good enough for everything. And then work your way up the pyramid to these more detailed things as you see a need. But don't feel a need to do everything perfectly. And I think the lesson on documentation today explains that pretty well. Yeah. What are your favorite tools, Richard, in terms of documentation? Hmm. Well, of course, there's the README files, but I really like Sphinx a lot. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, this I might be biased here because I use it a lot, but well, I probably use it because I like it. So Sphinx is a static site documentation generator. So basically that means you have all of the material in, uh, in Git or as text files, and then you run a command and it builds the HTML files, the website out of it. Or it can build PDF or EPUB or plain text files, like many different formats there, which is basically how many people do sites and documentation these days. But I especially like Sphinx because it's not just like, it's not just an HTML generator, but it actually is like, it reads what you have and makes it structured in some internal format, mm -hmm. which makes it really powerful because you can like, cross-link everything, you can do references, you can do indexes, all kinds of things, and then write mm -hmm. it out in a good format. And I mean, I haven't looked at everything else that exists in that much detail, but many of the other options seem like they're basically HTML generators mm -hmm. where you throw in raw HTML, but you can only make web pages out of it and it's not really processed inside that much. Yeah, so we'll see that later. I have maybe one more question, um, and then, then I can hand over the microphone back to you and we can start with the lessons. And the question is about Jupyter Notebooks, mm -hmm. uh, which we will also talk talk now uh, after after this intro. Um, so the notebooks are very popular for a good reason. Um, if there was one thing you could tell people like one tip you could give to everybody to to have a happier life with uh, with notebooks, uh, what would that be? Wow. So that's a hard question. Hmm. Happier life with notebooks. Okay, I would say know when to leave notebooks. So notebooks are great because they make simple things simple and allow so many more people to begin doing programming. But at some point, your project gets so big that the notebook will be holding you back. And then you need tools like, so automating things with reproducible research that we learned yesterday. And tomorrow there's a lesson. Is it Radovan and who's teaching with you? Is it Tom? Thomas? Thomas. So a lesson on modular code development, which I think is, like, when I first saw this after it was developed, two or three years ago. It's so amazing because it starts with, okay, let's do a little bit of analysis in Jupyter Notebook. And then we make it more modular. We like give it arguments and options. We make it a script. We make it where it can be run like automatically and really shows the whole process. So yeah, I would say maybe keep in mind when and how to leave notebooks for better automation and tools. Yeah, thanks a lot, Richard. So I have so many more questions, but I don't <laughs> think I have so much more time. So yeah. I will uh, I give the microphone back to you. I lean back here and I will enjoy the show. And, uh, and thanks, thanks for this uh, interview. Yes, thanks. See you, well, later. 
So now let's begin. So today teaching, I think teaching both of our lessons is Johann Helsvik and Temu Rokolainen. And they, well, I guess they can introduce themselves and get straight to the lesson. So with that, I will be off. See you later. Bye. 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 Uh, thank you, Richard.